today we will begin from 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7. Read verse 7. The end of all things is near. Therefore be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. Verses 7 through 11 discuss the lifestyle of believers in the end of times. In the verse today, it says that the end of all things is near. This refers to the end of this world. We are all approaching the end of this world. We must acknowledge that we are believers who live in the end of times. Verses 7 through 11 are the precious word of God for believers like us who live in the end of times. I was blessed by these passages and I would like to share it with you. 1. Signs of the End of Times Many people today say that the end is near. The verse here tells us that the end is near, but what tells us that the end is near? The signs show that the end is near. There are many signs that show that the end is near. One important sign of the end of times is the restoration of Israel. It says that the twigs of the fig tree get tender and its leaves come out. Matthew chapter 24 verse 32. The people of Israel were scattered throughout the world and they returned to their homeland and the nation was restored. This is the sign of the end of times. Another sign is the spreading of the gospel to the ends of the earth. Today, we can say that the gospel has almost been spread to the ends of the earth. Of course, there are nations that have not been evangelized. Yet, in a general sense, the gospel has nearly been spread to the ends of the earth. It says that the gospel will be spread to the ends of the earth before the world comes to an end. This sign is being fulfilled right now. Another sign is the increase in numbers of false prophets. Matthew chapter 24 verse 5 the disciples asked Jesus. They asked, What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Jesus replied, Watch out that no one deceives you. Also in Matthew chapter 24 verses 23 and 24, it says that many people will deceive others. The age we live in is filled with deceptions. There are many self-proclaiming Christs and many people are teaching the Bible incorrectly. There are many false prophets in this age and we can see that it is the end of times. Many false prophets corrupt the church. Another sign is that love is growing cold. In Matthew chapter 24 verse 12, 
it says that because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. Truly, in the end of times, love will grow cold, and people will be more wicked. Their love grows cold because they do not want to make sacrifices for others. Their love grows cold also because they need to discern who the false prophets are. However, the love of believers must not grow cold in the end of times. Even though the world we live in is wicked, and even though there are many temptations of false prophets, we must be discerning and not be deceived. We must also continue to love. Another sign of the end of times is that many will go here and there. Daniel chapter 12, verse 4. How easy is is today to go from one place to another. Trains and airplanes have become fast, and people can go from place to place quickly. Indeed, there are benefits of moving quickly from place to place, but it is also the sign of the end of times. Matthew chapter 24 verse 7 says that nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famine and earthquakes in various places. How common are earthquakes and famine? These are all signs of the end of times. We must know that the end of times is near through these signs. We must also prepare for the end of times. 2. Preparation for the end of times. We must be awake. Please read the following verse. Verse 7. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. It tells us to be clear-minded. That is how we can prepare for the end of times. What does it mean to be clear-minded? It refers to the awakening of our faith. If our faith is not awake but is asleep, we are not clear-minded. A person who is awake is a person who is clear-minded. We must realize that we are living in the end of times. Those who are not clear-minded cannot discern the times. They are drunk in this world. However, a clear-minded person can discern the times. The end is near. The end of this world is near. Only those who know this are clear-minded. We must have clear minds. We must be awakened. We must keep our faith by understanding that this is the end of times. Second, we must be self-controlled. It says in verse 7, be self-controlled. This refers 
to overcoming the self by controlling one's desires. In the end of times, everything is abundant. All things have been developed. Due to the development of science, culture, physical education, and all other things, everything is abundant. It is easy to live in dissipation because of the abundance of things. Those who live in dissipation cannot prepare for the end of times. Anyone who does not live in dissipation can prepare for the end of times. One is self-controlled when he overcomes himself. To overcome oneself means to stray from dissipation. It also means to get rid of debauchery. We must be clear-minded and self-controlled so that we can prepare for the end of times. 3. Lifestyle in the end of times How should we live in the end of times? This is what believers must do in the end of times. In verse 7, it says, pray. We must pray in the end of times. We must strive to pray. Why must we strive to pray in the end of times? Because of the growing number of false prophets, love that is growing cold, and the fast paced moving from place to place, people cannot pray often. Therefore, we must strive to pray more in the end of times. There are many good aspects of our seminary, and one is that we pray at least two hours every day. We also read at least 10 chapters of the Bible every day. I too have prayed more than two hours every day and read 10 chapters of the Bible after entering this seminary. We must really pray hard in the end of times. That is why God first commands us to pray regarding the lifestyle of believers in the end of times. We cannot defeat the devil without prayer. The devil knows the end times. He knows his time. The devil knows that his end is near in the end of times. Hence, he tries to deceive the chosen if he can. That is why it is extremely important not to be deceived by the devil. If we are deceived by the devil, our faith will be destroyed. Among the many signs of the end of times is the increase in number of false prophets. There will be many who claim that they are Christ. They are all deceptions, and without prayer, we cannot discern them and overcome the devil. The first thing we must do in the end of times is pray. We cannot emphasize prayer enough. Yet, unfortunately, there are more believers who do not pray than those who do pray. 
Therefore, this world is dark, even though there are many believers. Prayer has many functions. We must pray diligently so that we would receive power and defeat the devil, and we must carry out our calling as the salt and light of this world. Another duty of a believer in the end of times is to love. Verse 8 Above all, love each other deeply, because love covers over a multitude of sins. It says that we must love each other deeply. We must love each other deeply. There is a book that says the following. We cannot simply love with our hearts. We can love when we practice love. Based on my experiences, this is true. We say that we love, but in many cases, we cannot love because we have not practiced love. We cannot give because we have not practiced giving. Therefore, the passage tells us to love each other deeply. When we practice love, we will learn to love deeply. If we practice love, we will learn to love others even more. Yet, if we do not practice love, we will not act on it. We must love others. The object of love is our neighbors. There are no limitations to love. I hope you know that your neighbors are objects of love and love them. This includes those who hate us. It includes our enemies. It includes unbelievers as well. The object of love is not limited. It is wrong for us to love some but hate others. We must know that the object of our love is our neighbors, and we must love each one of our neighbors. Then how much should we love others? We must love others as ourselves. We must love others just as we love ourselves. We must love others just as we cure ourselves when we are sick, rest when we are tired, or just as we purchase things when we need something. We must give water to even our enemies when they are thirsty. It tells us to give food to the hungry. It tells us to clothe those who are naked. We must love others just as we love our own bodies. How must we love others? We must love with agape love. Agape love is holy love. It is the love that Jesus showed us. Jesus' love is unconditional. Jesus first loved us. Jesus sacrificed himself for us. I hope you will love others this way. Love others unconditionally. Love without expecting anything in return. And love by making sacrifices. 
If we love others with this kind of love, we can cover over a multitude of sins. This is written in verse 8. Love covers over a multitude of sins. Seeing the flaws of others is proof of lack of love. We cannot see the flaws of others if we truly love them. We can also cover their flaws. Love will truly grow cold in the end of times. We must understand the agape love of the Lord and love our neighbors just as we love ourselves. Next, regarding the lifestyle of believers, offer hospitality. Verse 9, offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. We must offer hospitality before others do. We must offer hospitality to one another. Faith is to act first. Faith is to ask for forgiveness after quarreling with others. Faith is to act before others. If we offer hospitality first, forgive first, love first, and act before others do, everything will go well for us. Yet we want others to treat us well first. We want to receive hospitality. We want to receive love. Thus, the passage says without grumbling. Where does grumbling come from? Grumbling comes when we want to receive hospitality and love. If we offer hospitality to others, our hearts will be filled with thanksgiving. However, if we want to receive hospitality, our hearts will be filled with grumbling. Next, we must serve others. Verse 10, each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. It tells us to serve others. Here it says, use whatever gift he has received. We have all received gifts. There is no believer who has not received a gift. Therefore, in that sense, all believers are needed in the church. We must serve others with the gifts we have received. Those who have received wealth must serve with their wealth. Those who have received wisdom must serve with wisdom. Those who have received skills must serve with their skills. God gave each individual a gift so that they would serve others with their gifts. That is why I too strive to serve others as the passage tells us to. When I go home, I serve in my home. When I go to church, I serve at church. When I go to prayer centers, I serve there. 
And when I go to the gym, I surf there at the gym. I find ways to serve wherever I go. Then I surf there. In the passage, it also says, "Faithfully administering God's grace." This means that we must be stewards who have been put in charge of our master's things. Thus, when we serve, we must not serve for ourselves, but serve for the Lord who entrusted us with our works. We will be wicked stewards when we work for ourselves. And we will be good stewards when we work for the Lord. We must serve as stewards when we serve. Stewards also do work that is appropriately given them. This means that we must not expect rewards after we serve. We must work without rewards. Serving itself is faith. Serving others is God's blessing. Isn't it a blessing to serve others when other people can't? Therefore, I pray that you will serve diligently. When God gives you the opportunity to serve, you might say that you have nothing to serve with, but anyone can serve. A widow offered God two coins. A child served with five loaves of bread and two fish. Hence, we believers in the end of times can also serve. We all live to serve. Serve wherever you go. Serve, offer hospitality, and love others. When you do so, people will welcome you wherever you go. You will receive hospitality. It also tells us to serve with the strength God provides. Verse eleven: If anyone speaks, he should do it as one speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength God provides. So that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory and the power for ever and ever. Amen. There are many people whose faith have been tested while they served in the church. How can a believer be tested while doing God's work? How can a person be tested while serving in the church? How can born-again believers be tested while serving together? Yet in the church, there are many people whose faith have been tested. Why are believers tested while serving God? That is because they did not serve with the strength that God provides. Generally, there are many times when we say, "I am tired," while we serve. I am so tired. People grumble. And their faith is tested because they think the work is difficult. However, if they serve with the strength that God provides, they would not be tired. Then, how do we know if we are serving with the strength 
God provides. We must understand that God entrusts us with the work we do when we serve. Let's say that I serve by washing church vans. God entrusted me with this work. I pray to God with this mindset. God, give me strength to wash these cars. Then I would diligently wash the cars. Then when I am done, I would pray again. I was able to wash the cars with strength from God. Thank you, God, for using me. Then we would serve without knowing how tiresome the work was. After we serve, we will thank God. Some people are tested while serving, and some people even leave church while serving. This happens because they did not serve with strength that comes from God, but attempted to serve with their own strength. Also, we cannot be acknowledged by everyone when we serve. Some people judge us. We must be prepared for all this when we serve. Then we can serve until the end. We are living in the end of times. As believers in the end of times, all our prayers, love, hospitality, and service will glorify God. In verse 11, it says, So that in all things, God may be praised. If we live in such ways, God will be glorified. Others will benefit from it. We serve others, we show hospitality. When we do so, it will benefit others. It will also be a blessing to us. This is in one way a conclusion of faith. Whatever we do and whatever commands we keep must glorify God, benefit others, and be a blessing to ourselves. Next, participate in sufferings. Verses 12 through 19. Verse 12, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering as though something strange were happening to you. It says, Dear friends, he is referring to believers as his dear friends. Do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering as though something strange were happening to you. One important fact here is that there are painful trials for dear friends or believers. Trials do not only come to unbelievers but to believers as well. Trials do not make just the unbelievers fail, but make believers fail as well. It is not just the unbelievers who die, but believers die as well. Why do believers face suffering? It is so that God would pour out great blessings on them. Therefore, we must keep our faith in the midst of sufferings, no matter what sufferings we encounter. We will receive 
greater blessings when we keep our faith. One, the mindset of believers when they receive sufferings. Jesus said that persecutions would come when we live righteously. Then, what should be our mindset when we suffer, are persecuted, and receive trials? We must not be afraid. First Peter chapter three verse fourteen. Tells us not to be afraid. Why did the author tell believers not to be afraid? If we are afraid, we are overcome with fear. If we think that we are in great trouble when sufferings come, we will actually encounter great troubles. When we become afraid, the fear will overcome us. Therefore, we must not be afraid when we suffer. We become anxious when difficult problems arise, but God told us not to be anxious. Therefore, we must not be anxious. Regardless, there are many anxious people. Great troubles are the problem, but the problem is anxiety and fear of troubles. We must not be anxious or be afraid when we face troubles or receive sufferings. If we completely rely on the Lord and trust God, He would help us overcome it all. Also, it says, "Do not be surprised, as though something strange were happening to you." Why is God testing me? Does God hate me? Does God not love me? That is not the proper mindset of a believer. When sufferings come, we must not be ashamed. In the text today, it says, "Do not be ashamed." Please read verse sixteen. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed. But praise God that you bear that name. Why does it say that we should not be ashamed? This is because sufferings come to those who desire to live righteously. Sufferings, hardships, and trials show that we are living righteously. It is proof that we are walking with the Lord. Hence, we must not be ashamed. Instead, we should be thankful and rejoice. In Matthew chapter five, verse twelve, the Lord tells us to rejoice when we receive sufferings. We must also not run away from sufferings. It is easy to want to run away when we face sufferings. We leave people, we leave the church, and we try to leave our jobs. This is not the proper attitude of believers. It is right for believers to persevere when sufferings come, and it is not the proper attitude of believers to leave. If we do not leave but persevere, and carry out our duties when sufferings come, there will be better days. 
Next, it says participate in the sufferings. It says participate in the sufferings. Two, reasons to rejoice in sufferings. It says that we must rejoice when sufferings come, not when sufferings go away. We must rejoice over greater sufferings than lesser sufferings. Why should we rejoice when sufferings come? It is because when we suffer, we participate in the sufferings of Christ. We also rejoice because there will be joy when Christ returns. Verse 13. But rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If we suffer while obeying God's word, we participate in the glory of Christ. Thus, the Apostle Paul strived to participate in the sufferings of Christ. Christ's power will be upon us in the amount of our participation in Christ's suffering. Also, in verse 13, it says, so that you may be overjoyed. If we suffer while keeping our faith, we will participate with joy when the Lord returns. We participate in the glory of Christ through sufferings. Verse 14. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed, for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Just as God glorified Jesus, he will glorify us too if we keep our faith in the midst of sufferings. 3. Sufferings of Judgment Verse 17 for it is time for judgment to begin with the family of God. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? Judgment comes from the family of God. Family of God refers to the church. Why does judgment begin from the family of God? It is so that God would save believers and judge unbelievers. Verse 18 And if it is hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? There is no place for sinners and unbelievers to stand. They will receive judgment and judgment alone. They will receive judgment and go to hell to receive eternal punishment. Verse 19, So then, those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful Creator and continue to do good. How can we keep our faith when we receive sufferings? If we commit our souls to God and fulfill God's will, we can keep our faith. With this, we will conclude the sixth lecture on 1 Peter. Thank you.